Welcome to the David Bordeaux Show, honoring the past, embracing the present, and building the future. Here's your host, author, martial artist, and fitness professional, David Bordeaux. Hey everyone, David Bordeaux here. Welcome to the David Bordeaux Show, where it's all about discovering the underlying fundamentals of success through the lenses of health, fitness, martial arts, and education so that you could take your life to the next level. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com dot com forward slash Bordeaux and that's spelled B O R D E A U X. Audible has over one hundred eighty thousand titles to choose from that you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. In today's episode, I sit down with Dee Dee Goodman, who's the founder and chief instructor at. I know I'm going to mispronounce this, so please forgive me. Chung Nu Redwood Dojo in Oakland, California, where since 1992, she has taught traditional martial arts to children, teens, and adults. She holds the rank of six degree black belt in Chung Nu and currently sits on the board of directors for the Association of Women Martial Arts Instructors. She's also a writer, editor, and poet. She has authored the book, The Kids Karate Workbook, which is a take-home training guide for young martial artists. And she's also authored a volume of poetry entitled Greed, A Confession. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dee Dee Goodman. Dee Dee, thank you for being on the show. I am so excited to have you on. Thanks for inviting me. I'm psyched to get to talk to you live. (laughs) Yeah, really. The only time that we do tend to talk, it it tends to be online. Um, What I would like to talk about, just to kind of get started, um, there are a lot of times that when I will talk with martial arts instructors, martial arts tends to dominate the conversation. But I am curious to start in a different place. I'm curious about your time when you were in college. And what I mean specifically by that is I've done a little bit of digging and Ah. just, 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 just a little, I I don't tend to research too heavily um, because I like to keep things relatively fresh. But if, if my research does serve me correctly, a, I believe you studied biology in college. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Can you tell me the story of how you came to study biology when you were in college? Okay. Well, I was always interested in the sciences. Uh, I was raised by scientists. Both of my parents were research scientists. And some would say it was inevitable because of that, but my brother wasn't the least bit interested in science. So. I was always a kid out in nature looking at animals, looking at things through the microscope, and I also always had an interest in um, understanding the mind and the brain. This was an interest that developed, I don't know, as, as a teenager, and that was where I thought I was headed when I uh, entered college and majored in biology. Um, I wanted to study neuroscience and understand uh, the mind and the brain. When with your parents, you said that they were research scientists. What did they, what was it kind of like their specialty specialty? My father was a nuclear physicist doing basic research and my mother, a basic research in immunology and hematology doing Mm -hmm. the kind of work that laid the foundation for what everyone now calls stem cell research. Wonderful. Yeah. During your time at university, uh, well, actually, I should ask, was it a college or a university? College. College. Okay. Well, I'll use the proper term then. Um, (laughs) During your time at college, um, did did you continue the path of biology still feeling that you were going in that direction um 
when you got as far as you did or while you were going, did you start to feel that maybe you have other paths that you would like to explore? Well, I, I began taking philosophy classes and are you still there? Uh, the my line went silent. Okay. Yes. Um, I began to think that philosophers might be the ones who were thinking about the mind and the brain the way that I was interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I ended up with a uh, – not exactly – it wasn't called a double major at my college, but a uh, biology major with – a big chunk of philosophy courses. And I ended up going to graduate school in philosophy um, as a result of that change of direction. What inspired the continuation of going further into philosophy? Uh, I felt that what I wanted to do was think about and solve problems uh, logically and read and study about biological research, but not necessarily do the lab work right. myself. So that I really felt that, that I was interested in that area of philosophy that I would call um, theoretical science, the sitting around and thinking about the results that laboratory scientists were getting in the lab, but without going and doing the lab work. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah, I think that describes what I, I was thinking at the time, which and, was okay. quite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of quite a long time ago, <laughs> thinking about where you are at now and when you were doing your grad work, how, if at all, how has the way that you think changed or have, has been influenced positively by your work back then? Hmm. I don't know that my thinking, Oh, if I say my thinking hasn't changed, I hope that doesn't mean I've made no progress <laughs> as a human being in all these decades. But, no. but I, I think my all my years of doing physical training, I think at first when I got involved in training hard physically in the martial arts, it was kind of a necessary balance to all that uh, intellectual – work okay. that was seemed purely purely brain work on the one hand purely physical work on the other hand and yet always a belief that the two were uh sides of the same human being right. so and i think i still uh feel that way you mentioned earlier that you had an interest in wildlife or um, the natural sciences to at a point. And I know that you do tend to be somewhat of a bird watcher. Is, is that, <laughs> is that correct? That is totally correct. Maybe even a little obsessive. <laughs> I didn't want to go there, but if, <laughs> if you're going to say that, <laughs> what got you into bird watching or even, um, wildlife watching, if you will, but specifically birds. I remember being fascinated with birds since I was a very small child and would come to the window uh, where, and we had a bird feeder outside and just watch them. But and I don't know I, if I can define why they just have such a charm and an appeal and, they're beautiful and they're varied and they, uh, they're little intelligences out there <laughs> doing amazing things. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a joke because, um, when I teach my workout on Saturday mornings in the park, I make 
all the students learn what birds are going by <laughs> as we work out. I, I know they joke about me because of that, but they've all learned certain birds that are always in the park there. It's kind of it's kind of interesting that you bring that up because I've been reading a couple of um, research articles recently, and I've also several months back, um, which I guess for some people's perspective, that's still considered recent regarding physical training with mental, um, mental challenges, if you will. Some will say mental training as well. Um, but the gist is if you, when you are physically training and you introduce a problem or a challenge to the mind or even another um, aspect of learning, what happens is that not only does your physical training improve, be it your body or your mind is able to remember techniques or movements better, you can become a little bit more efficient, but you also seem to have like a lessened stress factor when training without the mental aspect. Um, for example, there was this um, research that was just recently done where they had a split test of bicyclists and they put them through a particular routine and they did that. And in the control group, they just did the, the cycling exercise with the, um, not the, well, I guess the experiment group, but what they did with them is they would have them go through this exact same cycling exercise, but they would give them mental problems. They would show on a screen, a series of letters or something similar. And only when certain combinations of letters would come up on the screen, the participants would have to click certain buttons or not click a button. And so as they physically trained, they had this, this mental task to do well at the end of the, um, at the end of the experiment or study, they found that both groups of course, improve their VO two max, which is their ability to, um, take in oxygen during exercise and even, and even at rest. And they did have other physiological, um, increases. And I, if I remember correctly, they were about at the same level, there really wasn't much more of a training increase um, for the experiment side. But what they did find was when they, when the researchers put the participants, both participants, both groups, um, through another test um, of their endurance, what they found was that the control group would rate the experience at, uh, at a certain toughness or even, you know, like, a, like let's say if we're going from a scale of one to 10, 10 being the hardest thing you've ever done in, in life, they would tend to rate it a little bit high or quite high depending on the individual. Whereas with the, uh, the experiment group, I'm really blanking on the term and I feel pretty embarrassed and I know my professors <laughs> are going to yeah. listen to this and chastise me, but those that were in the experiment group, they actually rated the, the physical exertion a bit lower and sometimes even quite a bit lower. And the reason being is because while they were training, they had that mental um, thing that they had to do. So when they didn't have that mental aspect going on, they actually found that the training was fairly easy or, uh, or not as hard as the control group did. And that there's another research that, that talks about when learning completely unrelated things to what you are physically doing, you tend to retain that information at a greater level. Um, so your bird watching <laughs> group out there, uh, they, they may not know it, but yes, they, they, they are actually able to retain that information better than if maybe you were just chatting with them without the physical training, which anytime they see a bird or they, they hear a certain call or whatever it is you share with them, that actually helps them to remember, or excuse me, when they go to physically train, 
those right. memories are links, which helps them to incorporate or to perform a little bit better. So that's really exciting to to hear that kind of uh, your obsession. Uh, excuse me, your interest yeah. in birds, <laughs> your yeah. interest in birds, and the um, physical training kind of come together at that at those crossroads. Yeah, I'm going to totally take credit for that notion. <laughs> what I what I do kind of find also interesting, um, not specifically about that training thing, is is the idea about birds just in general. Because I remember when I was, I don't even remember, I, I want to say, man, back when I was in the third grade or something, probably even less than that, I had a teacher. She was an awesome science teacher, and she would explain about how birds are related to dinosaurs and how they're actually a closer link to dinosaurs than, say, alligators and such. And that was just the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. But one thing she did say was, you know, go home. If you find a bird, look at their legs, and their legs kind of show the, the scales and stuff, like the remnants of their dinosaur ancestors. And so I went home and I looked at my parakeet and I thought it was the coolest thing. I had some sort of dinosaur ancestor living in, right. my, living in my home. What is actually really exciting for me now is the the research, not the research, but the findings that are coming out of how similar or how how closely related a lot of dinosaurs and birds are or were, if you will, with the, the discovery that a good handful of dinosaurs actually were covered in feathers like birds and their vocal, um, the vocal cords or the vocal boxes that they have found in a couple of them. The, some of the bigger dinosaurs didn't roar or growl cause they didn't have that physical ca capacity, but they kind of actually more like quacked or like a quacking kind of sound, which seems ridiculous to think of maybe like a T-Rex or something quacking at their, at their prey. But I, but to think about, birds and, and you even said like the different intelligences that um birds have to think about animals like crows and to think about how intelligent crows are and the memory that they have with themselves and then to think about dinosaurs and to go wow you know they probably had a, a you know a very similar capacity like crows do and it's just it's super exciting to me to to think about those things and to um, discover that on, almost like on a daily basis, I'm always finding something new about birds and their connection to dinosaurs. And all right, I'm, I'm geeking out too much here on that. Well, they are totally cool. <laughs> With regards to the idea of birds and nature and biology and, and getting back to philosophy. Um, you, as uh, some of our reader, readers, listeners, some of our listeners might know, uh, you are an author uh, of a couple of different types of books. But what some of our listeners might not know, because my listeners tend to have a kind of a martial arts background, is that you are an author. You just recently, I guess, I guess it's relative, so I could say recently, um, had a book of your poetry published. Can you tell me a little bit about that book? Okay. Um, the book is called Greed, A Confession, uh, which is a title that a couple of people urged me not to use, but... Not to? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people were afraid uh, it would get confused with books about actual money related greed uh. um but it's the title the title poem is uh about a different kind of greed about a, a greed and hunger for the really cool things <laughs> of the world but um i've written poetry most of my life but did not really get serious about it until later in life, I guess, um, and began writing and submitting poetry to literary journals. And this was something I uh, did very much separately from my martial arts life. In fact, for many years, I never even uh, let anyone on my martial arts side know that I was writing and uh, publishing poetry. 
Uh, but I was very fortunate to um, have a book accepted by a publisher, which is uh, it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, if it's, you it's a it's a big deal. Yeah, um, I te- I write formal poetry, not exclusively, but a lot of what's called formal poetry. Which for people who aren't into poetry, that that means poems that use meter and rhyme, which um, for many years and including the years of my own education wasn't considered cool. <laughs> but right. uh, and yet, while not being considered cool, was totally cool because that's what music and lyrics mm-hmm. are based on. And everyone starts out life loving meter and rhyme and music. And so uh, when I began writing seriously, I was writing all kinds of stuff, but I was really grabbed by writing um, formal poems and trying to write them in a way that didn't sound too sing-songy. Right. And so uh, I wound up in that world, which to my surprise turned out to be kind of a subculture in poetry. (laughs) (laughs) I knew nothing. I I was an outsider, and I guess I still am. So you were an outsider. Because I I didn't get an English English degree. I didn't study poetry in school. Um, and I didn't know about the different, you know, cliques <laughs> in the poetry oh, world. Yes, I have but, some, uh, a few friends that are, I have one that's going for her PhD, um, in Syracuse and she is very formally taught and she's an awesome author, both short story long form and she's a great poet as well but she's very very much formally taught and has certain views um that i not be i mean i'm i'm while i i have authored books um i'm not a writer and i'm not a literary person so that is just such an outside thought for me and there is such a uh click and culture which you know uh, almost anybody that has done any sort of literary anything knows that there's definitely culture within the literary circles but even within poetry there are even further circles and cliques and and culture that is just remarkable but a good handful of my um literary friends the, yeah <laughs> there, there there's to to do formal poetry with meter and rhyme it's kind of looked still looked upon by some as not cool who does that that's kind of you know sing-songy for some you know and it's like that's what children do and when I was even discussing with my um, PhD candidate friend um, about how I like it that's what I I, I'm into and she just kind of looked at me like what what are you you know what, what are you talking about that's so childish and for me to learn that it's kind of childish, at least in her eyes and even some of the people that, you know, she associates with, I'm the kind of, I'm the kind of person who likes to be outside of the box, but just enough that I can still touch the box and get inside the box if I feel comfortable. But when it comes, like when it comes to things like, ah, meteor and rhyme, come on, that's just, and so then I'm like, no, I like that. So let's, let's push that envelope. Let's go in that direction. So you were on the outside of the literary circle of poetry and you happened to have gotten your poems published by a publisher. Can you tell me the story about how that, how that came to be? Well, uh, yeah, it took a long time. (laughs) (laughs) I, uh, I, uh, started submitting a book length manuscript I don't even know how many years ago I sent and it it at times has only been possible to submit manuscripts as part of a contest mm-hmm. publishers I think some of them fund their publishing venture by requiring uh people to submit to contests and pay a fee right um 
And so I did a few of those. One of the very first ones I sent to, I was, um, I was a finalist and I thought, whoa, <laughs> this is going to be a breeze. I'll get published by the next one. And so then 10 years later, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't submit for a long time because after that first one, I've got nothing. I would get the postcard back saying, you're the 999th person to submit to this. Good luck. Right. And I would hear, you know, I got nowhere and I didn't submit very hard for many years, just thinking it was hopeless. But this publisher, I, when they began doing print books, they started out as an online journal and became a print journal, which is the opposite direction from a lot of places. Right. Um, they had a preference for formal poetry and I submitted to their contest one year when I liked who the judges were. They had a, poet a contest for poems, individual poems, and a contest for book-length manuscripts. And in the same year, I liked who the judges were of the two contests. And I thought, if anybody is going to pay any attention to my stuff, it will be these two judges. So I'll just give it a shot. And that was the year I... I won the poetry prize for the individual poem and got a whole bunch of honorable mentions as well. Nice. Because <laughs> I shot everything at them that I had sitting <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> and then uh, the manuscript didn't win, but it was a finalist and they offered to publish it. So wow. it was one really good year. Nice. A couple of years ago. Um, and I, I guess it's it's luck. You have to call it luck without there isn't any false modesty in that because there's so many people writing good stuff and so many people writing stuff. <laughs> yes. You have, to, uh, have a bit of luck for someone to notice it. So right. um, I I'm very lucky. And once it comes out, then you, once again, you have to be very lucky for anyone to read it. So. Um, we're still working on that. And uh, if any of your listeners enjoy poetry, don't be put off by the the meter and rhyme <laughs> trick. Because, uh, very often people read my work and don't notice that it has meter and rhyme until after they're done. Wow, really? And, uh, I've actually also been published in journals that specifically say, don't send us meter and rhyme. Uh -huh. And I, I send stuff anyway. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, I've been published more than once in a journal that said they didn't take formal poetry. So oh, nice. I'm it's a big, I'm really a big... all about whether it's good or not, right. not about what rhymes. So, well, I, I appreciate that they say no meter rhyme and, you go ahead and just say, you know what, <laughs> here it is. And if you don't like it, you're not going to like it. So whatever, but here you go. I, um, that is kind of a, a nice segue for me to, um, go into actually talking about martial arts. And the reason why for me, that's a segue with the idea of if someone says, no, we don't want this, but you went ahead and did it anyway. And they, you know, some of them were like, hey, yeah, okay, here you go. This is great. This is nice. You've been a martial artist for many years. And when you started martial arts, I know a good handful of my friends who started at a similar time, sometimes some a little earlier, some just a little bit later than you, um, that, that are women that have had a lot of... A variety of experiences, but the, the experiences that a lot of the women that I know that have started around the time that you have, have had some really interesting, uh, challenges that they've had to overcome because martial arts was essentially seen as like a good old boys club. And for some women, it was hard to break into and, or be respected. Can you tell me, um, a story about how and when you got into martial arts? Sure. Um, 
I was in college and my best friend, um, one winter when we didn't have anywhere to go for the vacation, we were hanging out in the dorm and a friend of hers came to visit. They had previously trained together in a martial arts class and they started practicing their stuff in the dorm living room. And uh, I walked in and I saw what they were doing. They were kicking over the back of the sofa and stuff like that. And I said, what are you guys doing? Can I try? And I started trying to do a roundhouse kick over the back of the sofa. And I just, just something deep inside me really wanted to do that. I really wanted to do what they were doing. Um, there's no explanation for it, just as there's no explanation for why I love birds from the minute I saw them. <laughs> and uh, so after that experience, I talked to her, you know, who taught the class? Well, it was a fellow student at the college who had taught the class. And we decided to talk him into starting it up again. And that is where I first trained. It was Taekwondo. He had grown up in Thailand and studied with a Taekwondo teacher, a Korean teacher in Thailand. <laughs> right. Student run club, very formal, very traditional. He agreed to teach a group of students in the gym. So that's where I started training. Um, we were a few women, a few guys. The sexist thing wasn't a big issue there in that little class mm -hmm. until more guys started joining. And I realized that it was sorry if I'm I'm going to sound um, negative about guys at times. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Some of my best friends are guys. Oh, really? But, <laughs> you know, my is one but uh <laughs> you know guys will guys who know less than you do will assume they should talk over you interrupt you correct you instruct you mm -hmm. you know new guys would join who on their first day they would be telling me i was doing it wrong when they hadn't even learned it yet uh. and i think that fairly typifies the experience of a woman in a mixed class in those days. And it may not have changed all that much in a lot of classes since then. I know but, even, and I apologize for interrupting. I know even as an instructor, there are times that I have stepped in um, to, because I've seen some of my male students, not even, like, it's not even an ill intention, um, but they would, tend to offer more help or try to provide uh, suggestions or what have you. Or, and, and when I say help, I'm, I'm kind of putting it in air quotes because you, I wouldn't see that same sort of assistance, if you will, being offered to other male students, especially those who really struggled. And so sometimes um, I would see it as maybe it's just an attraction to that individual but what I have noticed um, when I've come across this and, and even in my own experience, it tends to be fairly similar to the here, let me show you how to do it. Let me tell you how to do it. Let me help you. There's, you know, for whatever reason. And, and again, some of them are not, they, they didn't have any ill intention. Um, it just seemed to be sort of a, a bias, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, that small college class was one thing, but when I later trained in a really big, uh, big club at UC Berkeley that was mostly men and mostly giant men and <laughs> about five tiny women of which I was one, you know, there'd be 50 giant men and five tiny women <laughs> in the typical class back then. <laughs> uh, it was, it ranged from, okay, get a partner. You can't get anybody. You can only get the other women because the guys will turn their backs and run the other way. If you go up to one to insist on being their partner, they tell you, no, you go be with her. 
and uh, it got to be that I would deliberately force them to be my <laughs> partner. <laughs> no, no, we don't accept meter and rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, now, wait, now was yeah, with their strong. with their refusal come from I don't want to work with women. Um, just because it might have been awkward, was it a oh you'll never get this kind of yeah, thing? Or it was you can't really do this. You're they do, they don't take you seriously. You okay. can't do this. You're not strong enough. I I can't do this with you. I'll hurt you. Ah. Uh, you won't be able to get this. Or I have no patience with uh, someone like you trying to do this. I want a real partner. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I had to teach a few lessons about real partners. <laughs> yeah. So with that, a lot of, go ahead. Sorry, a lot of people wouldn't put up with that. You know, that would be enough to make them quit. Right. It takes a certain personality to stay in and demand your rights, as mm -hmm. opposed to, hey, I'm doing this for my own pleasure. I don't need this. I'm going to go find something else to do. Now, from that experience, had anything changed from that experience moving forward or in different um, environments? Now, as you said back then, that was you were doing Taekwondo. And I know that you've obviously, well, obvious to me because I know you, um, but, um, you, you have changed styles and I do assume you've also trained with other individuals in between. Did mm -hmm. that same or similar sort of experience carry over or did you have other experiences, um, when you furthered your training? I have trained in places where the culture was much less sexist. Okay. Um, and a lot of that I think does come down from the people or person leading the school. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't mean that individuals within the school weren't, it didn't show those attitudes from time to time, but um the culture didn't support that attitude as a pervasive. Right. So not all schools are like that. That's the main issue. And even at that big club at UC Berkeley, the head guy was respectful of women and believed in their uh, talents and advancement, but he wasn't in the room running the show all the time. Mm -hmm. The guys were, you know, the black belts, the, uh, but yes, I've had different experiences. I've also at two different periods in my training trained at schools that were all female. And that too was an interesting experience in terms of the reasoning and philosophy behind it. And in the two cases, it was, they were quite different and they were doing it for quite different reasons. Um, how did you come come about training with the all women's organization? Back up in college, when the student who was running the club I started in um, took a semester off, my friend I was training with uh, connected us up with a school not far from the college, uh, mm -hmm. all women's dojo called Karate for Women, which was a <laughs> very original founded by. Uh, Pauline Short, who was kind of a legendary person in uh, women's martial arts, she she opened that school in 1965, wow. I believe. So you can imagine what she went through in her training, which was 10 years ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, so she started her school in order for women to have a place to train hard and not be looked down on by their training partners. Right. You can't train hard if your partners won't train with you. Right. So kind of the stuff I was describing from later, my next phase, which was down here in that big Taekwondo school, you get 
your training partners won't train with you. They keep sending you away to go get with the other beginner white belt woman who's your size. So she had created a space where women could train hard and get tough and nobody was going to give them an easy time and no one was going to brush them off. Nice. And they were some tough ladies. <laughs> and I, I, got, I trained really hard, not for long enough because that was only in my last year of college and then I moved. So, uh, But yeah, we used to leave that place with shins and forearms completely black and blue and Nice. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> well, no, it says nice. People <laughs> say, "Oh my god!" <laughs> right, right. I guess that does kind of <laughs> kind of come through there. Yeah. So that was really great, and she was quite quite a character. And when you started training as a student. Um, what was the, besides any potential issues that you experienced with training with men, what was the biggest hurdle that you had when you started to learn martial arts? Hmm. The thing that pops into my head, I don't know whether it'll, it's what you're, interested in what's into my head is actually a physical hurdle i was so into it and i trained so hard that i had some really bad pain in my hip joints and could hardly walk some of the time really? and there came a time when i thought i might not be able to continue it was so painful um but then i got past that as far as being a student and learning, I guess patience, that's what it was, patience. I, I wanted to train really hard. I wanted to make progress. I wanted everyone I was training with to do it with the same degree of intensity and uh, – progress. So I, I guess I would sometimes get impatient about waiting to learn the next thing. Something I see in my students all the time. <laughs> uh, I would sometimes get impatient with my partners, uh, hopefully not too overtly, but within <laughs> myself. Right. Uh, and, uh, but when I was training with my best friend, we would get impatient with each other openly and again i see this with the kids all the time you know they're with their best friend and one of them gets it and the other one doesn't and they say no no it's like this <laughs> right come on uh, come on why can't you do this just do yeah. it like this yeah so i i had to struggle a lot with patience and that may also mirror my uh my character uh outside the dojo I was just going to inquire outside of training. Have you experienced or did you experience or maybe still do you experience um, an issue with patience? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> of course I do. Why would, why would you ask that? I said it already, David. <laughs> uh, no. uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I struggle with that. At times, you know, the funny thing is, um, from the beginning of my working with kids in the dojo, I have had parents tell me time and again how impressed they are with how patient I am. <laughs> nice. And I know, I know it's not true. I'm a, I'm a terribly impatient person. <laughs> well, you obviously hide it well. Yeah, so I have thought about that a lot because I want to understand what it is they're seeing and right. um, see if I can't harness it somehow. But well, sp yeah, speaking of what they're seeing, uh, I'm actually interested in what they're not seeing, which you know you alluded to, like me, patient. Um, <laughs> what what coping mechanisms might you have? Uh, created or um, 
to help deal with the patient's issue or what things have you been able to find to kind of help you with that either to get around it or maybe even use your impatience to your benefit? Hmm. Well, as an instructor, I think what I have done is to change my, my mindset with respect to the relationship between me and the students, um, where I might, let me back up to that dojo up in Portland where I'm training with my best friend. You have a certain relationship with your best friend where you do get impatient with each other and you're friendly with each other. You're interacting on a certain level. You're intimate in your interactions. And so that kind of impatience and judgment is part of your relationship in a way. If it's part of your personality, it's also part of your relationship. But my relationship with my students is not the same as that. With my students, I'm stepping back a level and I'm looking at them as people I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure them out in order to try to get them to reach some goal. To The goal might just be learn a basic skill. It, it might be improve to the next level. Whatever it is, I have to step back away and look at them in a more scientific way, like they are. So they're a bird I'm trying to understand. <laughs> well, I was just going to say because of what you were commenting on, it almost sound, sounded to me like you were taking that philosophical, scientific approach um, or theoretical, if you will, where you're taking a look at it. Well, I, I'm a very visual person, so I use visual language, but you are observing or <laughs> there I go again, um, observing a, a situation and thinking about what, you know, either makes it work or what doesn't make it work or, um, something of that nature and going about it, like you even said in a scientific, uh, manner to come about that. And I know that for myself, if I think in that way, that's the way that I really start to thrive. But if I'm in a situation where I don't think like that, then I have impatience issues or other issues that I have tend to kind of rear their head. And when I was listening to you, it almost sounded as though you were taking your experiences, um, not only from college, but your other life experiences and using that philosophical um, mindset to to relate to your students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not that I never get impatient with them, but I sometimes have to remind myself to step back um, and look and go, okay, what do we need to do to advance our goal here? Not, why can't you get this? <laughs> We've been over the I that. <laughs> right. I definitely have not ever had those moments ever when training <laughs> ever. No, no, not me. Yeah. I, I, I face that almost on a daily basis and it's one, it's interesting because when I have conversations with my fellow coworkers, the language that I use and the way that I talk is very different than obviously when I'm in front of my students and even corresponding with other, um, my other peers and such. And for me, it's kind of like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde sort of thing. Cause I, I have my internal dialogue at times, but I also have my external um, presence, but it's not only the presence, but it's also the mindset that goes with it. Um, but yeah, there are times that why, why don't you get this? We've done this 500 times, but yeah, which kind of leads, yeah. which kind of leads me into the, Thing that I wanted to talk about next, which is you wrote a book um, for martial arts students, specifically kids, but you wrote a book um, for students to help them with their, their learning martial arts. Uh, can you tell me the story about how that came to be? 
Yeah, let me think back a little bit. Um, for a long time, I stuck to the view, you can't learn it from a book. And so you shouldn't want to go get a book and try to learn it. Now, this wasn't any dislike of martial arts books. In fact, I have a whole bookcase full of them. I love them. Mm -hmm. But I don't try to learn new stuff from them. Beginners can't learn martial arts from a book. And yet I frequently got requests from parents. Uh, is, the, is there a book we can look at? Nowadays, people more ask for videos, but some still like books and words, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yes. I, I even wrote in the foreword, finally, when I did do the book, um, you can't learn martial arts from a book. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a book you can look at to back up and support what you're learning from your teacher. And I decided to go ahead and do it. There was also a request from the head of our style. This was many, many years ago. Uh, he wanted someone to write a manual that was targeted at kids at a time when not that many of the instructors in our style were working with kids. And it took me a long time. I didn't get it done until, unfortunately, long after he had passed away. And it me connecting up with a really fantastic photographer and illustrator who really helped me get it done. I never would have gotten it done without her. But uh, I decided to go ahead and write something that had enough information in it so that a person working with a good teacher could use it to support their knowledge and also so that parents who drop their kids off at class and pick them up later but want to help the kids. Mm -hmm. And these were the parents who were making this request to me all the time. <laughs> right. I want to help them practice. What, what, what can I do to help them? But I don't practice. want to stay here and help watch to see what they're learning. Right. And even then it, it can be concerning at times, depending how the parent approaches it, yes. they can could make it unpleasant for the kid. They could make it pleasant. You want them to be able to be supportive you want them to understand what you're trying to convey and what's important and what's perhaps less important. Right. Less important that they get every single detail exactly right because after all, they're six years old. <laughs> exactly. You know, that kind of thing. So I wanted people to understand the, the sort of philosophical underpinnings and then the important basics. And I wanted it to be in a format that could be um, – used by people who don't do my style but might go to their teacher and say, this book says this, but how do we do this move? Is this right, and can I write in here what you would want me to uh, practice? So I hoped to make it kind of style neutral within the realm of kicking, punching, blocking styles. With it being style neutral, as, as neutral as one can get, what in um i guess what yeah what how did you come to choose what you included in your book well the the dirty little secret is <laughs> that it is the curriculum from my style up to purple belt okay with okay. some some extra things drawn in from taekwondo um, and other kicking styles that do more of the advanced kicking earlier on mm -hmm. because it's fun and because I, you know, you started kids kicking. want a certain <laughs> uh, So basically it is the curriculum up to purple belt in our style with some extra kicks. I happen to love kicking. That's probably... Well, I was drawn to Taekwondo because of that. Right. And our style has all those same kicks, but because we have so much other stuff, some of them get pushed a little higher up in the curriculum. So, Speaking of your style, 
one, I have no idea how to pronounce it. What's how do you pronounce the name of your style? Kung Nu. Kung Nu. Oh, that's easy to look at it. I, yeah, I was trying all different easy. ways. Yeah, Kung Nu. Uh, if you say it with a Vietnamese accent, it sounds a little better, cooler. <laughs> but Kung Nu is how us Americans say it. Gotcha. <laughs> What can you tell me the story of how you came to start to learn Kung Nu? Yeah, I I was training in Taekwondo. I was phasing my way out of that big university club and was training simultaneously at a small private dojo on alternate days. And someone there, I'm giving you the long story. Uh, someone there had found out about an organization called PAMA, Pacific Association of Women Martial Artists. They put on a multi-style training camp every year. And women from dojos in all styles would get together and train with each other and show each other elements of their styles. Um, so a friend and I decided to go to this camp. And at that year, I can't remember what year, it was so long ago, <laughs> I I took a lot of really cool, amazing classes with some really amazing women instructors. But the one thing that totally impressed me and stuck in my mind was Aikido. There was an Aikido demo and... I just, I had that feeling again, like the time my friends were kicking over the sofa back in college, that that was something I really wanted to do. And it took me a, over a year, but I finally called up that instructor who was from the Bay Area and began studying Aikido on alternate days. So I was doing Taekwondo at one place, Aikido at another place. And um, one of my old Taekwondo buddies from the big university club had somehow come across this Kung Nu school at some point. We had been out of touch for a few years, and I ran into her. And she was training at this Kung Nu school, and I realized that I had met some of the people there at this training camp. And so the next year, I went back to this training camp the women's training camp and a Kung Nu instructor was teaching. I took her classes and I just fell in love with it. It was uh, really cool. At the same time, my friend invited me to come to the weapons class that her instructor was teaching. He taught a weapons class on Saturdays and he opened it up to brown belts and above in other styles. So I had two, two things were drawing me to his club, basically. <laughs> this experience at the women's camp and my friend training with him and inviting us to do the weapons. Because the Taekwondo schools that I trained at at that time did no weapons at all. Um, and weapons are cool. You know that. <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, I started going with my friend to the to his weapons class, and eventually um, decided to go check out his regular dojo. And what? That's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, that's how I came to to that Kung Nu school. What basically. weapons were you training um, in Kung Nu? Uh, he was just teaching us the first two basic weapons of the style at that time. Uh, short stick, we call it tambo, which is like a, a screamer stick. Mm -hmm. And bow, the long staff. Those are my favorites. I love them both, yes. <laughs> so we started out with those. And since then, it, our style encompasses any, pretty much any Okinawan weapon and any Chinese weapon that anyone chooses to study. And... Um, this instructor happens to be very good at 
a lot of them. So three nice. sectional staff and we've done a lot of good stuff since then. How did you, but that was how I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, you're fine. Well, that was how I came to a school. I did uh, decide to leave the Taekwondo school. It was not working anymore. And the instructor wasn't happy with me doing all these other things. <laughs> right. So there came to be, there came to be a falling out. Um, uh, but it was perfect because I went into this new place and it was like a blend of the Aikido that I loved with the kicking that I loved <laughs> and it was, and the weapons. <laughs> so it was just perfect. And so that's where I've been ever since. How did you, well, not how, um, at what point did you realize or come to accept that you wanted to be an instructor? Um, I think, I think it was a natural development from my passion for what I was doing and wanting to share it with people. So at some point, my endless desire to get together with my training buddies and talk about what we were doing <laughs> evolved into the desire to teach it to others. Um, and then to different degrees and different schools that I spent time in, people did assistant teaching or helping with the beginner's class. Um, so that got a little bit of encouragement and development out of that tradition. Um, by the time I joined the Kung Nu school, I knew that I wanted to have my own dojo, but I also didn't want to have it in a vacuum. I didn't want to be, uh, a school with no organization, you know, not being a part of something bigger. Right. And so I decided upon joining the Kung Nu School, once I decided I really liked it and wanted to stay there, that I would be patient <laughs> and earn my black belt in that style so that I could open a school affiliated with that style rather than opening just, you know, school of me. Right, right. Which I could have done at that time. I was ready psychologically. I really wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to do it as a free-floating school, so I right. made my be patient, and it that that <laughs> way, yeah. Did you? Well, I, I guess I'll I'll preface this. I f my experience with martial arts instructors is that a lot of times the martial arts instructors learn. Sometimes that's in air quotes. Learn how to instruct through either their instructor or if they have the the privilege of having an, uh, an organization that has a an instructor training program they would train through their organization did you have any outside resources outside of maybe your experiences with your instructors um and or organization have you had any outside um help to become a good instructor or an instructor in general, but I assume you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I'd have to say no. I had no uh, instruction in instructing other than the apprenticeship, but I did take a very deliberate approach about that. I when he gave me permission to help with his classes I started out by trying to do things exactly the way I thought he would have done them mm -hmm. so that I could learn what that was about and then from there that and my my approach of regarding the students as interesting subjects of study <laughs> uh, 
to try to figure out how to to approach things as he would and then make it better and better and make it work for me. Um, and only after gaining a fair amount of experience did I start trying stuff out on my own. Now, I had done some instructing previously at previous schools, um, you know, and I'd made some of my mistakes there already. So I had a little bit of background, but again, it was apprenticeship and being thrown in the deep end kind of. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm very familiar with that. So, you know, I, I've done okay with that approach. And over the years I've, I've seen, I feel why some other people, some people, not there, nothing fits everybody. Some people don't do well with that approach because they don't have the empty cup when they come right. to it. They come to it thinking, well, I've taken this guy's classes, but I think I'm going to try everything differently. <laughs> I'm going to take his students and try all these other things that I think should work. <laughs> and, uh, they don't realize that this guy's been doing it for however many years, and maybe, maybe he's doing something because he's <laughs> already been through those mistakes. Found something that has so, worked. Yeah. So, uh, I, and I've seen people flounder doing things that really ought to work. You know, you, right. if you talk about it, it sounds like it should work, and uh, you know, uh, if you read about it, it sounds like it should work, but. Sometimes when you get in front of the students, those things just don't work. And sometimes <laughs> those, those students just happen to have a mind of their own, weird as it yeah. is. Yeah. So, you know, I, I actually don't think apprenticeship is a bad way to go, but it does need to be guided, I think, mm -hmm. somewhat. And then I think other resources and other knowledge about teaching methods and learning styles and all of that stuff that that too can be valuable, but it's not automatically effective or automatically valuable. So there, there needs to be a lot of guidance and people need to be willing to approach with an empty mind and, and uh, follow some basic guidelines that suit the person they're working for when they are apprenticing and work their way in a bit. What, so. what comes the easiest for you as a teacher or instructor, whichever term you prefer? Hmm. What comes easiest? You mean in terms of, can you say more about? Yeah. There, there are some people who have different, um, aspects of teaching that they do or, um, the way that they teach or the ability to interact with students um, or even the ability to relay information. Um, for me as, as a, an instructor, I know one of the, th the things that comes easiest for me is the ability to connect with most students. Um, I'm able to relate to them on a multitude of levels and that really seems to come easy for me. I, and part of it, I, I know for myself, comes from like the scientific view. Because if something's just not clicking with a student, I want to know why. I dig. I, you know, is it, a, is it a psychological thing? Is it a sociological thing? Is it a physiological thing? Is it environmental, which is also sociological? Um, and I work to understand. And for me, connecting with students tends to be the easy that it comes easy for me. Um, so, and uh, my, my instructor and good friend, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal, um, um, children instructor for youth. He's a, he's an awesome youth instructor and he's, he kind of taught me a good portion of what I know and I, I feel so ridiculous trying even comparing myself to him because it's just, he is just absolutely awesome. And what comes easy for him 
is connecting with the younger students. I mean, he's, he's also able to connect with the adult students, but he just has a way of connecting with children and getting into their mind and gaining rapport with them and helping them see the world through his eyes and buying into it. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And, um, that's, that's kind of, you know, like what I mean by what comes easiest to you as a teacher. And again, it can be a a variety of things. Mm. Okay. So first off, I'd say I probably wouldn't choose the words you chose that the connecting with the students. Um, I, my mind goes to more, um, what practical, uh, idea, which is it comes easily to me to change what I'm doing on the fly to mm-hmm. see what's happening and to wing it, um, you know, come in with a plan but it's easy for me to wing it when the plan is uh, not working or not complete or the, a different group of people showed up or it's, you know, something needs to change. I, I think I'm, I'm good at winging it on the fly. Uh, as far as how I relate to the students, um, something I do, and I would say it comes easily to me, but it, this is how I relate to people. I don't treat them like little kids or talk down to them, but I just treat them like small people who can do this stuff. You know, I just right. come at them with, with the absolute assumption that they can get this and they can do this stuff and I don't need to dumb it down and I don't need to talk down or be cute with them. I I really appreciate that probably because it does mirror mirror my philosophy. So of course I'm going to appreciate something that sounds like, sounds like me. Um, what a story that comes to mind from my experiences, um, when my instructor and I, when we owned a business together, uh, a martial arts studio. Um, we had a satellite program at the local Montessori school um, in Bowling Green, Ohio. And th- there was a student who whose mother happened to be a teacher there. And the student um, was in class. And I, unless physiologically there's something going on or there is a certain mental difference that might have, uh, create challenges, um, for either for myself or the student, I kind of prefer not to know if a student, you know, has ADD or some other sort of, um, difference because Mm -hmm. I, I, I approach them with a, like, you know, like I said earlier, a very similar uh, idea that they are, they are children but children that have the ability to do what we are going to do. And the student apparently had um, some differences, but I did not know that. And he had certain coping coping mechanisms that just were not productive, um, were not beneficial for him in class. An example would be if he it wasn't able to kind of get his, not get his way, but figure something out, he would tend to, be a little bit dramatic about whatever it was he was doing. And one example that I, that sticks with me is we were working on certain footwork. And so we were working on static, um, stances and then slowly adapting them to become dynamic. So going from one stance to another, and he just couldn't quite get his feet in the right position and therefore he wouldn't have balance and, but he would, he would be able to keep himself up. But what he would do is when he would feel that instability, he would then kind of not throw himself on the ground, but he would allow him to fall. He would allow himself to fall in a very dramatic fashion. 
And mm-hmm. I looked at him and I'm like, sir, that is not what we do. Stand up. He's like, oh, well, I fell. I'm like, I understand you fell. And when we fall, we get back up, get back up. And he did. And he, he tried it again. And he did his dramatic fall. And sir, we do not do that. Stand up. And after a while, he, he kind of got that I wasn't going to allow that to happen because the way that he would fall is not how someone would naturally fall because if someone were to lose balance the way that he was standing they would fall in a completely different direction because of the way his body mechanics were so i knew that he was doing this and also even the way that he um he interacted with me and so you know i i wouldn't allow that to happen and i encouraged him to continue because i know he could do it and he knew he could do it and then after a while he was doing it and there were a couple other times within that same class that i didn't particularly remember but apparently had an effect on him that when his mom talked to him and he was doing things and he was saying how excited he was about class and she came to a class um and watched how I interacted with him and how he interacted with me. She was just so thankful and was just, wow, you're really wonderful with, with him. And, you know, and, and considering he has, and she just started listing off oh, these, gosh. these differences. And I had no idea. And I didn't even know what most of that stuff even meant, but she was just so like, thankful uh, that I took the time to work with him. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not doing anything that I haven't done and won't do for any other student that I have. I mean, of course, I was extremely appreciative of the compliments that she was affording me. But in my mind, I didn't do anything special. You know, I, I showed up for work today. I worked with your, your wonderful student and yeah, that, that was it. But that, that's, that, I mean, she, she's an amazing person and, and her student is, is a wonderful individual as well. Um, but the thing is, is that, yeah, I didn't do anything different other than treat him as a, as a child that had the ability to do what we were doing. And that's the way that I, that's the way I teach. Um, so yeah, Yeah. so I, I can definitely connect with that. I'm totally with you on not wanting to know all the uh, limitations someone is believed to have beforehand. Sometimes a parent comes in, want, or sometimes a grandparent right. comes in wanting to list to me all the reasons why this kid isn't going to be able to do this or that, and I don't, I don't want to hear that. I need to look at the student as someone who can get where I want them to go, it's, they will all differ in how they're going to be able to get there. But uh, I don't need to be told, Oh, he's never, he's never going to do this. And he's going to act out like that. And sometimes I think that really works against the kids. Right. Yeah. What, what and you I, I already answered the question that I was going to ask. So I'm just going to move on. What are the greatest or what are your greatest stresses that cause you the most anxiety in your role as an instructor? Oh, wow. Let's see. I guess one of them is having the occasional kid who's really kind of out of control, who doesn't seem to respond to the structure of the class, the discipline in that sense, doesn't seem to respond to, um, doesn't seem to show that desire to please the teacher that makes discipline work sometimes. And it disrupts the class. So once in a while you get kids like that, and that I, I actually have a couple right now like that. And uh, the other one is just that I take it to heart, even after all these decades, and it really has been decades now, I have to confess. Um, (laughs) We were trying to keep that a secret. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, I, 
I take it to heart when people quit, even though I know intellectually people quit for all kinds of reasons. Most people quit. Everybody quits eventually. Mm -hmm. I know all of that. I know that at times it may be something I did, but most of the time it's just not. And, and yet I, I, I hate it when people quit. <laughs> right. Yeah, I you know, a lot of us instructors talk about this and I know it's it's something many of us struggle with. I mean, it's definitely a personal thing even even if the reason is not a personal reason, for example, you know, someone gets relocated due to work and so they they just cannot be there or money situation or something just outside of, of your control. And it, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it can be hard because I too take it personally, even though I work to, to, to divorce myself from that, because there's just some things that I cannot control. I have no say over and it's not a reflection upon myself as for them to quit. Um, I mean, sure, there are some times that that has happened and there are probably some times that it has happened and I don't know about, but I do know that the majority of times it's not within my control. It's nothing personal. And if they had the ability to reverse whatever was going on, they more than likely would at the same time. It's still, it's like, why, why, but, but, but I'm <laughs> awesome. And, and you're training so well and, but we can make this work. <laughs> Right. Yeah. What, and, and you, I mean, this might even roll into or expand from that, but what is the hardest thing for you about being a martial arts instructor and how do you handle it? Sorry, I, I missed an early word in your question. There was okay. a little blip. Sure. Can you say that again? Yep. And I, I basically said that this might be an expansion of that last um, question, but what is the hardest thing for you to handle about being a martial arts instructor and what do you do to handle it? Hmm. Oh, tough question again. Let's see. Ah. Uh... Hardest thing to handle. You know, each one thing pops into my head, but then I immediately have an answer for it. So uh, that is on hard days, days when I'm exhausted, when I feel like I'm not going to be able to give a good class because things have been so hard or I've been so tired or sick or whatever. But strangely enough, I've experienced enough times over the years that on those worst days, I often give the best classes. Really? Uh, maybe it's kind of the, the exhaustion principle where you stop thinking about what you're going to do and you just go. <laughs> I was just doing a training class um, today with some of my older students. Um, and they they respond very well to sparring and they don't like kata or forms and so i've been really working with them on their sparring to get them you know to get engagement and today i set them up with a a sparring match with three people it is continuous sparring you go for time not for points and go and you know, they get excited because they're young and they, they want to try to show how, how awesome they are in that. But what's fun for me is that after about a minute and a half, they start to get winded. And like many people know, once you get tired and you get physically exhausted and you sometimes even mentally exhausted, the way, what, how you perform is kind of your base level of training. And like you said, it just, you don't really think about it. You just go. Now, of course you hit a certain part where physiologically you just can't go and sure. things fall apart. But when you get tired, you rely on how you've trained and what you've trained. And you don't necessarily have the, the luxury of kind of 
tweaking certain things to hide your flaws, if you will. And then you add an additional person into it. So it's not just a one-on-one match. Now you have somebody else that's kind of a wild card. You have no idea if they're going to be on your side, not on your side. Are they just sitting back? So then you have that mental process. So not only physiologically are you getting tired, but you're mentally getting tired. And I really like to put them in those kind of situations because then that show, helps to show me as an instructor and uh, um, as, as, a, as a coach to what, can, what do I need to think about and how can I help them individually and as a class? Because if I'm seeing it, you know, greater than one person, I know, okay, I need to work on these areas or we need to work on these areas. But I really do appreciate the exhaustion um, aspect of it or tired because yeah, you just, you go on what you know um, and you don't think you just perform. Mm -hmm. I also, I could give a more philosophical answer that might tie back to things I said about my beginnings and my impatience. (laughs) Uh, It's a challenge for me sometimes to accept that students don't necessarily come to class out of the same kind of passion for martial arts that I had when I began. Yes. And I want people to have the same kind of passion for traditional martial arts, for that type of training, for that type of Zen-like focus in the workout, you know, that it's a meditative workout, to stop asking questions about everything, (laughs) to come to it with that goal, I want to get this just right today, but instead to come with the goal of training hard. I... I wish people had that same kind of passion and I have to accept that it's a very rare student nowadays Mm -hmm. who comes to it with that same type of interest. Yes, definitely. And I be, since I, my main job is working at a charter school, most of these students aren't there to do martial arts. They are there because they have to be there. And when working at, you know, at, the dojo outside of outside of school outside of the charter school that was kind of my thing is that ah why don't you have the zest (laughs) the the (laughs) vigor for this and so then i would find that as a you know kind of a challenge for myself is what can i do to maybe help them find that i mean it may not happen today but maybe tomorrow (laughs) i'm not that i'm not (laughs) impatient but maybe tomorrow um, but yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that and, and be, you know, and, and when, when we, when we become instructors, we become instructors for, for certain reasons. Now there are some instructors as, as you know, and some of our listeners know that they're instructors that their passion is money or their passion is ego, you know, so they, they, they do that, but uh, I've met so many more instructors that they're instructors because they love it. It's part of them. It's part of their spirit. And yeah. And, and, and when you're working with students that don't necessarily have that and yeah, they're here, I'm going to kick, I'm going to punch, I'm going to do whatever I do. It's like, why <laughs> find that, find that fire, find that passion. And so that, that becomes a challenge for me to figure out, you know, what can I do to help them you know, kind of develop that. But also the ones who come with a specific desire, and I'm thinking more in terms of the adult class because I find it hard to fill. It's relatively much harder to fill the adult class than the kids class because adults are looking for certain things. Mm -hmm. And typically they'll come to class with some particular interest in mind and they will want me to serve their interest right? Um, versus they are coming to try this out and become passionate about it, which is, you know, what I, my fantasy world, <laughs> that's what we have. Droves of people who are just like me at 18 <laughs> <laughs> would be coming in the door and uh, getting totally hooked on this. 
um, as opposed to coming in and saying, I'd like you to teach me some practical self-defense that'll work in this one situation. <laughs> right. I don't really care about that other stuff. I'll put up with a certain amount of it. Of course, they don't say all of these things. Sure. I'll wear those fancy pajamas if I have to, but let's just get through with what I what I am here for. Yeah. Or else they may say, I just want to do the forms and I'm not yes. going to show up for the sparring. <laughs> I don't, I'm not really comfortable with the partner work. Mm -hmm. you know, and I want someone to come in with an open heart and find out what that whole picture is. But less and less do people uh, do that nowadays. It seems to me that it's very common for people to decide in advance and to come in, I'm the customer and this is what I want from yes. you. Yes. So that I guess that's really my biggest frustration with the adult program kids are a whole different game but kids will always come hoping to find a passion for it because that's how kids approach everything they do you know they want to find the passion in the first five minutes and if they don't then maybe they want to quit but, <laughs> right. but still they they are looking to be passionate about stuff and so you have something really exciting to work with with kids uh, even in an era where uh, people regard the transaction with their teacher as a customer. Yes. You know. So, yeah. Can you tell me the story about your greatest failure as a martial arts instructor? Oh, my. Hmm. I guess I can think of a time, and I've probably done it more than one time, but uh, early on, I'm glad to say it was early on, and I hope I don't do this anymore, but I was probably uh, at, uh, I mean, this was at a Taekwondo school, and I wanted to teach, and I got permission to start a daytime class because I was a freelance writer, and so I could do a daytime class. And a student who was an existing student in the school but had schedule problems wanted a daytime class. And what happened was I did the thing young teachers do, which is I had one student in front of me, and I was trying to make them get it right. Mm -hmm. by telling them how to get it right. <laughs> so if you can picture being the only student in class and having a teacher who's really enthusiastic and is right on you trying to correct everything you're doing wrong, <laughs> that's probably not a very pleasant feeling. And that person was very unhappy. They came to the class a couple of times and then they went and complained to the head instructor and uh and i sort of knew even while it was going on that it wasn't working but Did... it's it's such a good lesson though about how you can't you can't make people get everything right by telling them to right and you have to learn that um it was a lesson about that it was also a lesson about how young instructors need guidance and need to be apprenticed in a group, not sent off one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I think. When you say in a group, what do you mean? Uh, in that context, what I mean is have the apprentice working with the, uh, the rest of the community present. So, for example, in the Kung Nu school... I would assist in a class that was being taught by the head instructor but uh, and supervised by the head instructor. He wouldn't say, okay, you're my newest instructor. Uh, go in the next room with this student, do some stuff that I won't see. 
then I'll get some feedback from people who may or may not understand what's going on. Whereas this other Taekwondo school I was at, the really small school, they wouldn't, the head instructor wouldn't allow a junior instructor to teach if she was present. Whoever was highest ranked had to be teaching. No one was allowed to be there. So if I wanted to teach a class, let's say I was a uh, junior among the black belts, that meant all the other black belts would have to stay home that night. Like it physically very, they could not be there? They could not be there. It was a bizarre situation. Wow. Uh, and so, so you're putting this new instructor in this position with no, they won't see how you did or be able to give you any feedback or be able to step in or, you know. Right. Wow. Can you tell me the story of your most significant accomplishment or greatest success as a martial arts instructor? Again, hmm. you ask hard questions, David. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Because also, by, I put myself on the line by by picking these things out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> that's what you're trying to do here, isn't it? Let's see. Well, I have a student I'm particularly proud of, but I hate to say that because I have lots of students I'm really proud of. But I have a student who... I have many students who kind of grew up in the dojo and were mm -hmm. excellent. But I have a young woman who did that and went away to college and then came back and lives in the community and continued. And is still in the community, who is my senior student now. And I consider her in, in the manner of... Uh, students my biggest success i've had many really awesome kids grow up in the dojo and go away and have wonderful lives and they too are great successes but if you see what i mean as an instructor yeah it's, it's yeah it, it's like saying okay which one of your students is your your favorite <laughs> uh no <laughs> they're all my favorite <laughs> they're all my favorite they're all amazing but you want them to come back and, and be a part of the community. And, you know, you're kind of lucky if anyone does that yeah. in a way. And even you know, I joke with my kid, with the kids when they get to high school, I joke that I hope they won't get into college because <laughs> if they get into college, they're going to leave town. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I always say, where are you applying? And they tell me all these great ambitious schools that I know they're <laughs> easily good enough to get into. So I say, well, I just have to cross my fingers that you get rejected everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to have one come back to town to live here and become a part of the community again is great. And I had another thought that it flew out of my mind. Um well, if it comes back, we can definitely, definitely readdress that. Yeah. Well, what? Go sorry. ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask the a next another question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. What is the greatest piece of advice that you have ever received from a martial arts instructor? Hmm. And, and it, I mean, it could even be a lesson that wasn't specifically stated to you. Uh huh. Probably. Gosh. Oh, I wish I had thought about that one in advance because <laughs> I know I've had some amazing advice from so many people. So many people. Well, we can come back to that one too. <laughs> yeah. Can we let, let the back of my mind work on that? I might not come up with 
one thing, no, but no problem. So we're going to kind of change gears a little bit. And when have you been the most satisfied in your life? Uh, I think the times I've been the most satisfied in my life have been the times that I've been training the hardest when I've been doing the most physically, mentally, both. Well, physically, because that helps me mentally. So when I was training, teaching cardio kickboxing in the mornings, training on alternate days and teaching all my classes. I think I would say those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I say it a little bit wistfully with a little bit of past tense because eventually a knee problem made me stop doing the kickboxing classes. And I can't, in general, train as hard. Right. Wow. Um, do you do anything to compensate for that or to get as close to that as possible? I try, and at different times with varying degrees of success, depending on what's going on in other areas of life. Um, but I've I've never... I've never gotten the same disciplined routine that I had. And this is a, a truth about me since you, you dig for those personal <laughs> truths <laughs> that I do better with discipline when it is serving someone else. So okay. but showing when it's, when those it's for yourself, classes. but when it's for yourself, you, right. Okay. You have a little bit of a challenge. It's harder. It's harder for me to, have that same level of discipline. So for myself, for my own workout, my routine is somewhat less disciplined than it was when I could teach those classes that were at set days and times. Now it's more, I'll, I'll get on the bike, the stationary bike, and I may do it uh, crazily for hours sometimes and then other times not at all and i go for uh long walks for exercise and i notice a few birds at the <laughs> same time um but again uh, that'll go in phases also so i'll i'll have those different workouts i do but they'll happen at different times on different days with sometimes it'll be just the bike intensely for a few weeks and then it'll be the walking the lake intensely for a few weeks. So it doesn't look like that same level of discipline that I have when I must be there in order to serve others. What makes you laugh? Oh, I love to laugh. Uh, human foibles, <laughs> silliness, uh, um, Giant egos make me laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, the insanity of the world makes me laugh. <laughs> you must laugh on a constant basis. Then. I'm laughing a lot these days. Um, yeah. Uh, and sometimes just uh, things I see in nature. If I see animal behavior, if I see something cool. I, I laugh often. I Is, love humor. Do you have a funny story about yourself that you'd be willing to share? Oh, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I think I'm too well defended to have a funny story <laughs> about myself. All right, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> what is I, the greatest misconception that people have of you? Uh, that I'm patient and relaxed. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm quiet, and sometimes people mistake that for internal calm. Uh, I do have 
I do have internal calm that I can tap, mm -hmm. but the fact that I'm sitting quietly doesn't mean that I, it's being tapped. <laughs> <laughs> If we were sitting here five years from now celebrating what a great five years it's been for you, what achievements would you be celebrating? I would like to be celebrating another book of poetry and with people actually reading it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Five years. Hmm. I'd like to be celebrating a group of kids reaching black belt or reaching their best level without having quit. Let's say a particular group of kids who are starting, who are maybe yellow belts right now. I have a particular group of kids in mind, actually. It, it almost seemed as though you did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, celebrating things that are happening now, continuing and getting better. Um, what is and, but, but also finding more time to write and achieving that. More poetry. Yeah. What what kind of things inspire you with regards to writing poetry? Uh, thinking about stuff. Uh, it's the philosopher and the scientist in, still in my brain. Seeing something and thinking about it a lot and then being able to distill that into some kind of uh, imagery or kind of crystalline way of conveying it mm -hmm. without uh, writing a long lecture. Well, I am at my last, it's not necessarily, it is a question, but um, it deals with pieces of advice. So I'm going to circle back. Do you happen to have any um, greatest piece of advice that you've re received from an instructor that you can think of? I think it was to shut up and train <laughs> <laughs> and also to shut up and teach. That is not to talk all the time. Not lecture so much. Yeah, that the, the best teaching is silent. You know, there, there, I just arrived at it. I had a particular teacher now many teachers have have discussed the same idea but my aikido teacher years ago did a silent class where not only were the students supposed to be silent but she also was silent really what was and that like it was amazing because by making herself silent she forced us to look at why it's so valuable to be silent and to train. You had to notice better. You had to pay complete attention. You had to shut off your desire to tell your partner what to do, <laughs> which gets not only in their way, but also your own way, uh, maybe even worse in your own way. And, uh, that really stuck with me. I, I even wrote an article about it for a newsletter once. Um, the value of silence and the power of silence. That That's probably it. That's the instructor and the advice. And it uh, meshes with similar messages from other people at other times about talking too much, not talking too much. Um, about trying to get the students to appreciate silence and that they don't need to ask questions all the time. It's, it, it spreads out from silence into all kinds of issues about teaching and learning. So 
there's that answer. Yay. Well, the last thing, uh, this is pretty much the closer. Imagine that you have many, many wonderful things about you as, as you already do. And the ages have, have come. It's over 200 years from now. And everything that you have possibly done has been completely erased from memory with the exception of this one book who that happens to have a passage by you. And that passage is your greatest piece of advice. What great piece of advice can you give to our listeners to act on? Oh gosh, I'm going to give a cliche probably, but it's, don't let anyone stop you from doing what you feel you want and should do. It's the same as follow your passion, I suppose, but it's don't let anyone stop you. Well, that's that's a really good message. That's that's something that I have have struggled at times within my life to follow because there would be these inner drives or these inner knowings, if you will. And they might not have even been knowings. It could just have been a false understanding, but there have been times that I've allowed people to, you know, influence me to not do something when Mm -hmm. I had the capabilities of doing it and I had the, the understandings and visions that would support what I wanted to do and what I understood that I could do, but yet I allowed others to prevent me from doing that. But then there are other times and this part is more of the way that I am is that I don't allow others to stop me from doing what I want or I'll even see it. I'll even kind of have it as a challenge, if you will. If if I'm going along, following my own path, um, I, and not necessarily my own passion, but like the the drive that I have, and others say, "Don't do that. That's not going to work. Why would you do something like that?" I often brush that aside, and sometimes even use that as fuel to kind of push me even further and sometimes I've gotten further than where I probably would have had they not said that Mm -hmm. I I have to add one more thing I I thought of something that's actually really important to me personally which is don't let yourself stop you either because as a youngster and even as an adult I struggled with terrible shyness and I stopped myself from doing so many things. And when I see kids in my classes who struggle in the same way, it really uh, moves me to try to get the message to them. Don't let yourself stop you from doing things. You're going to look back years later and you won't have stepped up. You know you want to do this, but you're you're afraid. You're shy, so you're going to decline over and over. And you're going to get to a certain age and look back at all the things you didn't do that you wish you had done. So don't let anyone else stop you. And above all, don't let yourself stop you. That is awesome advice. Well, Dee Dee, I really appreciated our time together. And I hope that maybe we can do this again in the future. There are so many more questions that I have. Um, But I want to say thank you so much um, for being on our show. And thanks for having me. And it was really fun talking to you and getting to hear your voice live and um, dealing with those probing questions. (laughs) All right, Dee Dee. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, until next time, we'll catch you on the other side. Before you go... I want to say thank you. Thank you for taking this time to listen to the David Bordeaux show. I know that there are many things that you can spend your time listening to right now, but you chose to spend it with me and to listen to this show. And for that, I am greatly honored. 
For the times that you're not listening to The David Bordeaux Show, I want to share an offer that Audible has made to the listeners of The David Bordeaux Show. Audible is offering a free audiobook along with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. The great thing about this offer is that regardless if you continue with the service or not, the audiobook is yours to keep, even if you do decide not to continue. I've used this service for a really long time. I've purchased many books and I've listened to them a lot. I've even had to cancel my service twice. And the great thing is, is that my books were still there, able for me to go and download and re-listen, um, even without the service. I've since restarted my service and I've purchased many more books and I've listened to a lot of them on my commute, turning my, essentially turning my commute into a great learning opportunity. There are two books that I would like for you to check out if you have the opportunity. And you might even get one of these for free if you decide to take Audible up on their offer. The first book is called So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Cal's audiobook details why the development of skills supersedes passion in the quest for work that you love. Not only does this book support many of the understandings that I already had, it opened my eyes to ways of how to go further and improve my skills to help accelerate my successes. The other book that I would like to recommend for you to check out is How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams. Yes, the creator of Dilbert. In this book, Scott details many of the failures that he's encountered in his life. He also explains how those failures led him to win big, and most of the time in ways that no one could have predicted. This audiobook is not a roadmap to success. Rather, it illustrates how Scott pursued a conscious strategy of managing his opportunities to make it easier for success to happen. All that you need to do to get one of these audiobooks for free, along with a free 30-day Audible trial, is go to audibletrial.com forward slash Bordeaux. That's B-O-R-D-E-A-U-X. You could choose one of the books that I mentioned or choose one from over 180,000 titles that they offer. That includes newspapers, magazines, and classes. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash Bordeaux, that's B-O-R-D-E-A-U-X, and get started today. You've been listening to The David Bordeaux Show. To find the show notes or to comment on today's episode, go to davidbordeaux.com forward slash podcast. To subscribe to the podcast or leave a review, search The David Bordeaux Show on iTunes. Until next time, thank you for listening.